Procedure and read the thing and take the action, or you can just proceed under the uh, emergency uh, uh, resolution. So you go to the emergency. I mean, we're using Zoom. When we, when we get to the point, we don't use Zoom. Then yeah, I think we reserve that. I don't want to get angry or things like that. I think we, either way, right? Either way. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. So, so I'm, yeah, I'm fine with that. Just proceed. Yeah. That's good. yeah. Okay. Here's, uh, Using the coronavirus and they had to allow them to for everybody in the audience. Ed has uh, joined us at a video conference. It will be uh, audio only. Ms. Lawrence, could you call roll, please? Mr. Miskowski? Here. Mr. Hodges? Here. Mr. Garber? Here. Mr. Morin? Here. Mr. Greenwood? Here. Next item we have on the agenda is a moment of silence followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. If I could get everybody to stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next item we have on the agenda is the review and adoption of the meeting agenda. Mr. Chair, move adoption of the amended agenda before us. Second. Motion made probably seconded to the amended agenda to any seven. Seeing none, Ms. Lawrence. Mr. Hodges. Aye. Mr. Garber. Aye. Mr. Morin. Aye. Mr. Miskowski. Aye. Mr. Greenwood. Aye. Next item on the agenda is public comment period. Speakers have one opportunity of three minutes per individual or five minutes per group on non public hearing matters. Please, when you come up to the podium, state your name and your address and when you're speaking to the board. And open the public hearing period. Five minutes. What do you think, Mr. Chair? Mm -hmm. He wants to know time. Three or five. Oh, yes, yeah, so five minutes. He's speaking, speaking for a group. Mm -hmm. Yes, I speak for a group of uh, customers of my farm based business that are oh, living. Right, say your name. Chris Couch, okay. uh, owner of Dream Tree mm -hmm. Farms in Awood, uh, District 5. And I do serve customers in all of the districts in the county. Um, and I come to you tonight. Last month, we talked about the federal FDA regulations there. This month, we're going to talk and how. Basically, we haven't been applying those to Kit and King William. Today, we're going to talk about state regulating agencies of VDACs and Department of Health. In front of you, you have a letter that clearly states that I'm a food manufacturer. I'm not a restaurant. Food manufacturing companies are very different in the state law. 
I'm by the new regulations that are just put out that I've uh, been working with and trying to, to abide by and putting, building all this stuff together. Basically, what I'm saying is I'm not a restaurant, as, as the state of Virginia has determined. I'm a food manufacturer. I, I label my products. Right? Restaurants don't do those types of things. I'm at a loss right, on how we can continue to incur fees. This past month in July, it's another $7,600 worth of legal fees, bringing our total to $38,665 that we have spent on a salad. Right? And it just has gotten to a point where it's a little bit insulting, obviously. The only thing that I've seen happen this month is I received a letter from the Commissioner of Revenue assessing my farm again with back taxes uh, from October 2019 to June 2020. Now, in this assessment, it was not for sales in King William. It was for all food sales in all jurisdictions of the state. Now, the time that was spent to go and pull this together, nobody ever asked me how many I sold in King William, right? But again, Mr. McRoberts has said that sales outside of King William, King William does not have a taxing jurisdiction for, right? And so again, this office is just doing what they want. This now brings a total of $3,500 of taxes that I have been assessed on every food sale I've made in the entire state of Virginia. And I don't believe any of them are taxable under our meals tax guidance or our ordinance. How many other people are being taxed like this? With no justification, no clarification. I've asked countless times. Do we recognize VDAX? Do we recognize the Department of Health in King William? Right? I mean, those are state agencies. How is a small business supposed to operate when your state agency is telling you one thing and then your locality is telling you something different? Right? I'm the one that's pushing back and asking for clarification. I'm simply not getting any. That's really all I have prepared for tonight. I do wish you the best. I hope that we can work through this, but time will tell. Thank you. Good evening. I actually look good with your what I can Thanks, see. Uh, Bob Earhart, 644 Edgar Road, 5th District. I come here to support Chris Couch this evening. Uh, I think it's an abomination what this county is doing to him. In November of last year, one of the last things I pleaded with the board to do was to resolve this without getting the lawyers involved. The only people that are benefiting from this are his lawyer and Mr. Andrews. It's not the citizens who are paying for these taxes, who are paying for the lawyer fees. It's not Mr. Couch. The lawyers are benefiting. We need to start thinking, what are we doing? What promises have been made so far? What promises have been kept? What promises uh, need to be fulfilled? All right, so the second issue I want to talk about is the issue of the school budget. Here we are, four months we didn't have schools last year. We're increasing our school budget. My question to Mr. Moran previously on the school budget was, uh, quote unquote, in April, uh, the budget has been under review and is subject to change on a daily basis. And I have injected very little due to the fluid situation. We're not using transportation, we're not using buses, we're not using cafeterias, we're not using that food. Why are we continuing to increase money? Why are we not reallocating money? Why are we using more taxpayer money for a service which isn't being provided? Lastly, budget as a whole. We need to start looking at where is budget cuts gonna be made? As I understand it from a very reputable lawyer in Virginia Beach, the latest deficit for the state is $236 million. That money is not going to be coming to, from the state for various programs. Let's not expect our citizens to pick up that share that the state's not going to be providing to us. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Well. 
else. Mr. Wolf, do we have any people on the Zoom? Yes, sir. Closing the public comment here, seeing no more. Next item on the agenda, we have the consent agenda. Mr. Chair, I approve the consent agenda. I'll second. The motion made and properly seconded to approve the consent agenda. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, Ms. Lawrence? Mr. Garber? Aye. Mr. Warren? Aye. Mr. Muskowski? Aye. Mr. Hodges? Aye. Mr. Greenwood? Aye. And eight, we have presentations on resolution 20-53 and update by the general registrar concerning redistricting, cybersecurity, CARES, relief funds, and the special election. Ms. Allison Fox, general registrar. The first time I'm speaking to y'all in different positions. <laughs> it's kind of new. Um, and, and, and yet the same. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. Um, good evening. I'm here to talk to you guys tonight about the memo that you have in your packet um, talking about redistricting, cybersecurity, CARES relief funds, um, special election, as well as COVID-19 and the restrictions that it's put on the office, as well as added to with the elections that we have going on in the, in the um, county. Um, we'll go through each one individually. There are a couple of things I'm going to add in that have since happened since I wrote this memo for you all. If you have any questions for individual one, we can wait until the end, or you can ask me each individual section, and then I'll be happy to answer. I am still fairly new, so if there is a question that you ask me that I need to find out, I will let you know quickly after, after this meeting. Um, the first thing on here is redistricting. Um, that's kind of, we haven't gotten a lot of direction from the state on redistricting just yet. The census was held off for a brief moment with COVID-19 and everything else. Um, I was told that it was kind of back on track now um, for that piece. So once we get guidance, I will have a little bit more clear direction on how we're going to go, who's going to be impacted, and what stage we're going to have to take to send out mailings and do all of that fun stuff. Um, the cybersecurity, I've been working closely with Mr. Wolf with the IT department. Um, the state House Bill 2178 was passed. It went into effect. Um, it is the new cybersecurity standards for my office, but also the county as a whole. Um, so we've been working closely together to try to make sure that we are in compliance for the county as far as our cybersecurity standards are concerned. Um, we have been working on, there were various um, like spreadsheets and things that we had to answer and work together. And we I worked with Code Blue at first and then worked with Travis because there was that transition period that we were working on that um, and got that taken care of and we are, where we need to be right now, there are some standards that we still have to meet and some deadlines that are coming up. Um, but there were two options with this cybersecurity system. There, we could either take the route of putting the general registrar's office on their own system and making them separate entities altogether from the county, which was not worth doing because it was more expensive to do that as well as the county still has to, as a whole, be in compliance with the state's codes, whether I'm lumped in or not. Um, so the most cost effective was just to work on it as a whole, and we would just come up with the cost from the, both different offices to make sure that we could cover that. Um, there has been one cost so far with the cybersecurity, and that is a contract that we have, a three-year subscription more so, um, with a company called Nova 4, and it's a phishing company, so it sends out phishing emails to the employees of Kingland County to kind of train them so that they know what they're looking for. It kind of, it gives Travis a tabulation of who's opened it who maybe responded, that type of thing. So that we know what we need to focus on and how to address that issue so that everybody can know. So those are just different steps and different things that we need to do to stay compliant. And that initial piece was around $2,000 for a three-year subscription. Any questions on cybersecurity before I move on? No? Um, CARES grant money. Um, so the same as the, the county, our office received CARES grant money to assist with the increased costs from the state for, for COVID-19 for all elections. Um, for our office at the time of writing this memo, we had not physically received the money to the county, but we have. Um, I was notified at the end of last week that that money has come in, so we are able to start moving on and, and using that money to pay for some increased costs for this upcoming election. Um, one of the items that we are going to be purchasing is a new ballot tabulation machine um, so that we can increase with, with COVID and the new shape changes 
that have come with the mailing in of ballots. There is a new standard where ballots can be counted a few days after the election is over if they're postmarked the date of the election, which would require a separate machine because we cannot reopen the machines that are quarantined after the election. So we have that machine now to help cover this cost with the, in the increase of the ballots being mailed out and what's coming back into our office. Um, we've also done a couple of other things. We're still we're looking at possibly doing a part-time helper in our office to help with the increased um, number of early voting, whether it's by mail, in person, things of that nature. And that person would only be temporary from now until about December once all of this is taken care of and the election is fully over and it's been certified and processed. Um, I'll segue into the COVID restrictions and the impact on the office. Um, for, for these elections that we've held, we've had to start these processes and these things starting in March when we had our presidential primary and then we had our June primary and then now November. Um, the state has helped in getting us the PPE that we need for our localities. For the March election, we did spend money to help this because we weren't sure what we were getting from the state and we wanted to make sure that we got supplies in before they were depleted in any way, shape, or form. So we did pay um, money for some supplies within the state, also sent some of theirs to help us just offset what we may have needed or what we weren't able to get. Um, but with this, it's had us doing extra training and making sure that we, that the staff know how to sanitize properly, what to do, how to keep people distanced, making sure that they have all of the equipment they need to keep them safe, uh, as well as, you know, the new regulations on how often they have to wipe down machines and doing all of those fun things. Um, it has increased our curbside. So we do have somebody making sure that they are available and doing curbside for November. We probably are going to be increasing the number of people we have at each polling place to make sure that there is somebody, one or two people, 100% dedicated strictly to curbside voting, and then as well as having the people inside doing their jobs there. So nobody's having to leave their post to be able to do something else. Um, so there have been new restrictions. There have been a lot of extra things that we've had to do for these elections. There's already a ton of steps that we already take to run an election, but these are just added. And so the state has been helpful with sending us things. We have new restrictions such as single use pins. Once the pin is used, they take it with them. We don't have one just sitting at every little um, ballot box. Um, we have single use privacy folders. Once they've taken a privacy folder, they take it with them. They can throw it away or they can take it home. So it's just added things that we're having to do now to make sure that we're keeping up, but the staff are doing great with it. It's definitely been challenging making sure that we have everything that we need, but we, we've been making it work. So the curbside is for anyone. Yeah, so um, curbside, so typically in the past, curbside is 65 and older or somebody with a, with a disability. Um, but with COVID being the case, they're, they're allowing curbside to be used for anybody that's interested in doing curbside. Um, I think the curbside on election day may come down in numbers. I can't predict that fully because I, I don't really know. Um, but with the, with the increased early voting, with coming into the office curbside early or mail-in, I think that you may see some, the lines will probably still be there, so patients will have to be packed the day of the election, but uh, I think you might see some of the curbside numbers going down because they can do it early now. I wanted to add something that people may not know. Are you going to give us more information closer to the election? Sure, I mean, yeah. So, um, the election, which means they can actually come here a month in advance and yeah. vote in person in your office. Yes, so okay. early early voting starts September the 18th, okay. Okay. and it'll go until October the 31st. We will be Monday through Friday, 8.30 to 4.30 p.m. in our office until the last two Saturdays before the election. We will operate those two Saturdays, October 24th and October 31st, from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. those days. So we will be open and available for 45 days prior to. Mm -hmm. So, so with mail in and postmark. You may not know the results of the election for a while. Um, I think you'll know a fair uh, amount. I mean, unless we have an astronomical amount coming in after the fact, um, we do a really, I believe, a thorough job of working closely with the local post offices. And we call them each day. We, we coordinate the week of, and then that day of the election, either they come to us or we go to them and pick up anything that they might have gotten that day so that we don't miss anything. So there are some that get through the cracks where maybe they dropped it off in the city of Richmond 
and it didn't make it through the process to get to us. Um, since I've been here, I don't know what the increase will be for this election as far as after the election, um, but I've only had a few trickle in so far. So. You can people that do the mail and now this can't you know, actually bring that. We're going to have a box outside where they can do it instead of putting it in the mailbox. So we're going to talk about oh, that good. here in just a few minutes. Always ahead of you. <laughs> we're we're going to get to that. That piece is coming right after this memo, and I'm almost done with it. Um, so the last thing on this memo is the special election being held February 2nd of 2021. Um, the election was called this past month for um, treasurer in King William County. So that election is coming up. That's not a planned election. Obviously, it's a special election. It's not being held on a standard election time. Um, so you're looking at some costs being incurred for running that election at a separate time. Um, but it all comes down to just the ballots being ordered, staff being trained again, machines being tested, monitored, and all that other fun stuff. Um, so you're looking at about 10 to 12,000 to run that election that year. Um, and it's not you know, we've got the normal elections going on, but we don't have a presidential primary in March. So we had three elections this year. We can handle three elections next year. Um, the timeline for that is dated here too. Um, December 4th is the deadline to file for candidacy. December 18th is the first day of absentee voting for that election. January 19th is the final day to register slash update your registration for that election. And January 22nd will be the last day to request an absentee ballot for that election. So all of the timeline would stay the same keeping it in February, the 45 days out, all of that fun stuff. So that makes it a little bit easier for people to know and to plan. So we're probably looking at the same uh, guidelines for voting. Um, as far as COVID is yeah, concerned, yeah. I would assume so. Um, but for that one, you will have to note that because this is not a typical state brand election type deal, we probably will not get the free PPE that we, will, that we have been getting for these other elections. Uh, I'm not really sure I'll have to ask that question to the state because there have been other special elections during this time that have been called. So I can reach out to those localities and ask. Um, but typically we've been, they've been very generous in the items that they have sent to us and we've had some left over and we've been very frugal and we've been very resourceful of keeping hold of those and keeping them in our locked areas and not opening them and contaminating them so that we can reuse them. So we will take assessment after this November election and see what we have left to see what we will need and if, if anything for February. I had a question now that you brought that up. Uh, since we do have care that maybe this is something that Ms. Casanero would know too. Since we know we're having a special action, we know how many people maybe we need. Can we use the CARES Act before December 31st to buy PPE for this election since we know it's going to be used for that or it can't have to be used? I think you can do that. Right, so that yeah. And if I can get it purchased it. and get it ordered and paid for by December 31st, right. then we should be within those guidelines. And I'm going to look at the rest of the items that we think that we need for November and see kind of where the money is. I think we'll be just fine on what was allotted to me um, in my department. So, yeah, that's, we can definitely look into that. Any other questions on the special election? No? Okay, the next item um, is the, the resolution that you have before you. Um, resolution um, 20-53. So this resolution was put together. Um, it's not been approved 100%, but it is within the General Assembly. The governor has issued a budget amendment to his bill, budget bill, and some of those items are with elections. Um, one of those items refers to a ballot drop box and having one centrally located or potentially located at the various places around the community for people to be able to drop their ballots off. Personally, I believe centrally located would be here at my office so that I could be the one to check it and do all of those things with it. And that it's a little bit more monitored than putting it somewhere that's centrally located that's a public facility in the heart of the county. Um, so with this, this resolution is basically asking if this should be passed and it is a requirement to have this ballot drop box, then we will move forward and get one done unless you guys feel that a ballot drop box is necessary, hands down, and then we can still look at getting one. I would. I don't know what the other thing. I make a motion that we approve the resolution for the fifty three. I'll second. Motion made and probably second. Go ahead and do it while we're in the middle. Okay. Probably be any other discussion. Okay. Not, Ms. Warren. Mr. Warren. Aye. Mr. Muskowski. Aye. Mr. Hodges. Aye. Mr. Garber. Aye. Mr. Greenwood. Aye. That's all I have. Do you have any more questions for me based off the memo and any information? No? Perfect. 
Thank you very much. <laughs> Old business. The assessment update Natasha Jarlian, the director of finance, and Steve Justin Grapevine. Good evening. Tonight we wanted to brief the board on findings thus far with the reassessment project. In January 2019, the county contracted with Bright Minds LLC to complete the January 2021 reassessment project. Some findings between 2015 and 2021 assessments that should be noted are as follows. 632 new accounts were created for 2021. 244 accounts out of the 632 were not assigned, linked with other accounts, or previously bundled together. There were 11,673 total parcels for 2021 compared to 11,204 total parcels in February of 2019. 469 new parcels have been created. Building permits for interior renovations, additions, in-ground swimming pools, porches, decks, detached garage, and other improvements were not maintained in the camera system. The added value of these types of improvements may be small compared to the total property value, although they will add up over the course of a few years to a significant amount of taxable real property. Home and or buildings that require certificate, certificate of occupancy were maintained in the county system, but were missed and were not added to the tax roll previously. Warehouse building values were not assessed previously and or not included in the tax roll. Although it may appear they were in fact valued assessed, this is due to having a combination of separate uses in one building, such as a warehouse, office and storage or a warehouse and retail. For warehouse properties with multiple uses listed, a building value was recognized. However, the warehouse portion was assessed at a zero value. This type of data cor correction may appear as a significant increase to the property owner, well above any required market adjustment. Land values previously were not equalized according to the fair market value. Even though land values have been relatively stable since 2015, an increase in land assessments was recognized due to overall equalization. The 2015 commercial assessed values were missing the consideration of the sales comparison approach and income approach. The 2015 assessed values for commercial properties were based almost exclusively on the cost approach. Bright Minds LLC studied and considered the sales costs, and income approaches at the local level for commercial properties, including regional and mid-Atlantic searches for special use, heavy manufacturing, and other property types with limited local data. As with land, the final reconciliation may appear as a significant increase to the property owner, well above any required market adjustment. Tax-exempt properties were grossly underassessed in 2015. Churches, schools, government buildings, water sewer treatment plants, etc., will see a significant increase in 2021. Bright, Man's, Bright Minds LLC approach was to provide a fair and equitable opinion of market value regardless of ownership. This time I'll, I'll turn this update over to Stephen, who is um, on the Zoom meeting, and he can receive any questions from the board. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a question? How are these things overlooked? I mean, in this. Stephen, are you on? Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. No. Yes. Good evening. Uh, Mr. I'm sorry. Hart, I had just asked the question. Um, in your opinion, how were these things overlooked in the prior assessment? How were all of these items that you just went through, or in particular? Yes, sir. The items that we were just discussing. Um, you know, it's it's it was a different firm. Um, you know, I'm not really sure exactly how they handled every aspect of the project. Um, 
I know that's one one reason. Um, you know, working with the current system that you have to maintain the information, I know that's been kind of an ongoing problem as well. Um, and really just having somebody to, to maintain the information from year to year, um, it's, there's been about a four year gap, four or five year gap. Uh, so. Just talking about the one with the occupancy, I mean, if they have to complete that, the D and the residents, where is the failure that they didn't get on the tax roll after that? Um, I apologize. I had a little bit, little bit of trouble understanding you uh, on that question. I'll get a little closer to the mic. Uh, oh, thank you. If it went through the occupancy permit, then what, what happened after that? We should have known that it should have been on the roll. I don't quite understand how you, how you get your occupancy. I've never had a problem in receiving a tax bill in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think I think there's just a disconnect between when the approval, uh, when that when the not not necessarily the occupancy, but when a permit is is issued for um, you know, at the very beginning, and you know from that point until it's approved, it's just been a loss of the cracks situation. Can you, can you hear me now? Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure where I cut out, but we've, we had a couple cases where there was a, a building permit for a home issued in, in 2011. And, um, you know, not just your average home, but a very significant, uh, nice home. And we'd go out to the field and, and see the property and then look at the record and there's nothing on the record for that house. So, how many of those particular type properties are were, were my out there? Just call, call, call. Uh, in that case where we've missed, where an entire house was missing for years and years and years, I don't have an exact figure. I'd say maybe 20, something like that, um, something in that range. Is it is it right in, the, in the chain? Say or building or zoning? They issued the occupancy permit. Is it that maybe we've had so many so much turnover in that department? Is it possible that something happened there and was just never conveyed? Uh, like like Natasha mentioned um, in one of these points, I thought kind of going through this whole project that uh, maybe a better scenario would be to have that data entered, even if the project wasn't, hadn't started, enter the information at 0% and then we can track it. It'd be, it'd be better, easier to track it that way as opposed to having it at zero until the certificate of occupancy is issued. So I really feel that that would, would help and be a more foolproof, um, you know, way to maintain the data. And honestly, if, if, if it were possible to get a digital copy of the plans, because I know it's a lot of uh, paper that's submitted when a new house is, you know, being proposed and I think to have a digital copy of those plans on, on file would be very helpful. Um, that's probably very, something, that's probably something we can do with the new system that we're implementing to envision. The new camera system will probably do something like that. We can always talk to them about that. I guess the requirement now is one set of plane stays plane and for that particular. Uh, Residents, 
construction does it work that way? And when, when you submit your plans uh, to build a house, you generally, I'm thinking maybe you bring three to the courthouse. I'm not sure. It's been a while ago. I set a contract in my house. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's been a long time ago. It's probably been eight years ago. But it was a fundamental requirement. I, I, and I thought that planning and zoning one was, I don't know, maybe he can answer that. Yeah, he can raise the yeah. same. Okay. And Ron. Okay. Uh, yeah, there's two sets of plans. There's one that Residential, you only keep the plans for three years, what? or you keep them continually if the project hasn't been completed. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure where the breakdown has happened on this. How it's gone under the radar for years. Mm -hmm. The problem I'm seeing is that, like I said, that these companies that we've hired, it's not just they're supposed to be looking at stuff, the plans that are stuck in the books. They're supposed to be driving around to every house and seeing these things. I'm surprised that they've been missed. For so many years, like I said, we have all the technology we have nowadays with GIS. You can see an aerial photograph of stuff that's all over. You can see that house is an ad a year or so, and then they just go and look at it. Now, that's what we're told that we were supposed to have pictures and stuff of every house that's what we're paying for in the past. But I mean, we knew it wasn't happening, but now I guess we found out. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Any other questions for Stephen while we have him? Yeah, do you have any questions for Stephen? Just any? Um, no, Stephen, thank you. Mm -hmm. Stephen, can you stay on the line though? Because there is another resolution later in the evening that they might have some questions for you, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, I'll, I'll be here, no problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I mean, I'll just say it's, none of this makes me very happy. Oh, I, I know. And especially the stuff that I'm seeing in here that seems to me to be procedural that could be corrected in, in the building. I think we need to really, really focus on getting those procedural things working the way that they need to work. And I know that you probably share that desire. Yeah. Next slide. Okay. Yeah. We have on the agenda 9B, the CARES Relief Fund update. Ms. Bobby Tessin Air, County Administrator. Gentlemen, uh, the information that you have in front of you uh, is basically a folder with the 9B agenda item listed on it. Uh, it wasn't part of your packet. But uh, the Board of Supervisors to date has approved accepting and expending um, approximately 200, uh, I'm sorry, $2,992,194 in federal funds related to the Cures Relief Act. Um, as part of that, we allocated $571,509 to the town of West Point as their proportional share. Uh, in previous discussions with the board over the last several work sessions and uh, regular meetings, uh, there was an agreement to allocate up to $645,406 to the King William County Public Schools. Uh, they are working on those expenditures. Uh, they're working with our finance department and um, we're moving along on uh, getting their IT and uh, other needs addressed. Uh, in previous uh, conversations, we had allocated up to 275,000 to the local business support and to regional agencies. Um, I would expect that that will be increased um, as we move forward and start actually receiving um, applications. The board had agreed to $50,000 to be um, appropriated over to the Economic Development Authority to help them with their grant program for the local businesses. And then our initial discussions was up to about $100,000 for King William County to repay ourselves for certain types of expenditures. What I would like to bring to your attention is the last page, which is basically a um, financial breakdown uh, that uh, the finance director has provided. It shows what was expended in FY20 prior to um, um, 
June 30th, and then what we were estimating. Uh, of course, what you're seeing is the 657,000 for the schools, approximately 275,000 for local business support, 50,000 for the EDA. And then if you'll look at the long list of items for uh, King William County, uh, those total a little over $500,000. Um, those are related to several things. Um, with COVID has come many other requirements. Uh, the Virginia Office of Safety and Health has pushed out a infectious disease guidance uh, with allowing us about 30 days to implement all of these um, categorization of physicians, risk, high risk, low risk, um, policies to address it, physical barriers, all of these things that we were not even really aware of until it went into statute on uh, July 27th. So we have been working very diligently uh, with all the departments to try to address the needs. Um, so you'll see the breakdown where circuit court is right around 51,000. Uh, that was to address the unfinished wing when uh, Judge Bondurant and the other judges have requested space for um, uh, the courts, the, the trials, the um, jurors. So we we're having to um, outfit that to where it would be a basic, make, meet the basic needs. At the same time, because of the added court um, cases um, and the building opening up again, we had to dedicate a custodian. Um, so this includes uh, about five months of the custodial salary as well. Uh, the 360 complex, uh, that was basically an expansion of space, um, which is around 56,000. The IT services, supplies, and equipment is around 44,000. That has to deal with um, allowing staff to have the equipment to remote work. That also includes um, updating our servers. Um, we're going to be expanding our VPN licensing so people that um, do remote work will have access to all of the drives. And um, because of the higher demand um, for Zoom and for just technical support, uh, we're committing five months of an IT um, position to it as well. Under fire and EMS, that's 177,000. Uh, a great part of that is the extractors that we're purchasing for station one and for uh, West Point and Mangadick uh, Volunteer Fire and Rescues. Uh, the Sheriff's Office is 120,000. Uh, we had budgeted 130,000 for tough looks and we're going ahead and purchasing them if for some reason uh, the state comes back and states it's not a valid purchase, then we still have the money set aside uh, that we can use to reimburse. Uh, general PPE, you know, as you heard from Allison, um, there's needs, so we're trying to prepare uh, kind of for the long haul. And then uh, facility improvements. Uh, this comes back to that in the Office of uh, Safety and Health. Uh, the physical barriers. Um, we're going to have to be putting in some counters. Um, we're going to be doing the plexiglass um, screens. Uh, there's quite a bit of things like that all um, throughout all of the buildings that are going to uh, be required. So that's pretty much what we are doing with the money for the county side. Um, I know that uh, Mr. <coughs> Moran is going to be talking about uh, the broadband. Um, there is 225,000, if you remember, that is um, been appropriated to the capital fund for broadband initiatives. Um, and there may be an opportunity to utilize some of the CARES money for some broadband activities. It depends upon the timing and the type of request. I've also included in here the example letter that went out to all businesses in the county on August 14th, letting them know about um, our program, letting them know who to contact. And I've also included the uh, handout that we're going to be taking to all of the businesses starting this week. Uh, it includes who to contact, so we are training staff, all staff, to be able to answer questions on this. Um, basically, it's going to include the flyer that's been created that's also out on our website. Um, the program overview documentation that talks about who is eligible, what are eligible costs, how to go about it, um, what happens if you're denied, things like that. 
Um, we're also including a hard copy of the application uh, in case somebody feels more comfortable filling it out. Hard copy, or they can go online. Uh, we have a second section which is addressing the EDA grant, um, what is eligible in an application for businesses to be able to fill out. And we are also including the Rebuild Virginia because uh, this program um, has a much broader scope than what our tears money um, can handle. Um, so this is an actually a very good program. Um, and you can uh, receive up to $10,000 as a business. So those are the components that we're going to be taking out to the community, um, meeting with business owners and just making them aware of what is available. Um, I think that the staff has a very good idea that we are going to be probably hand-holding a lot on some of these programs. Um, just because it's, it is going to be confusing, I'm sure. Um, and especially our um, small business support program requires it's a reimbursement basis. So all of the invoices that apply, all of the, the payment statements have to be part of the application. Um, but uh, staff has been made aware that um, it's going to be kind of like helping people fill out their um, 1040 form. We're going to be there to help them in any way possible. And if um, their expenses don't meet one program, then we're going to look at another and attempt to help them um, to apply for those. Okay. A couple of the things that we talked about in the work session. Um, the idea of approaching some of the child care facilities to see if there are any opportunities for them to utilize any cares funding for any expansion of services. And I think one of the things that he wanted to look into was the possibility of any type of um, you know, rental or mortgage assistance program that we could possibly use this funding for. Um, and those are some eligible costs. Cost. Um, the mortgage assistance is an eligible cost now that um, they've put out more guidance. Um, so, yes, all of that. If, as we're out talking to people, we're basically going to be also canvassing them to find out what their needs are um, and then um, kind of go from that direction. Now, is that program we need to run or is that somewhere we need to direct them? That the, um, some of the CARES money truly could be used for mortgage. Um, assistance, rental assistance, things like that. Um, I won't say that we have really put a lot of work into creating forms or documents. I'm sure we could just mirror kind of what we have on a lot of our applications, uh, just tweak it. But um, no, it's really going to be just getting up there and canvassing and finding out what the needs are with this first rush. That would be over and above what the state is already offering so far as mortgage assistance. And mm -hmm. Well, that's kind of what I've, I've yeah. Look, I kind of unplugged for my vacation, so I haven't been, you know, uh, reading much more than the packet of the sound. So they they are offering something. I don't know. Yeah, I've, I've heard of a couple that I haven't delved very deeply into, into, into any, and I think I sent something over to you guys what the state was offering, but I, I didn't have a chance to read it. So the state is now, it, but they are offering some guidance on, on how it can be spent because when you speak to them, they'll tell you. Sounds reasonable. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's that's the yeah, kicker sure. is the fact yeah, that. We have to, in good faith, make the decision if we're going to support some of these. But the last guidance, and that's one of the nice things about these programs, is that they continue to send up updated guidance pretty much weekly on now what you can use it for. Um, so uh, mortgage assistance is actually one of it. So uh, rental assistance as well. Um, but we're going out with this first with the small businesses to see what the needs are in the community. Um, and then we'll do a second way um, for other areas. Because I'm sure that people will talk to us about a lot of stuff. I know that the um, um, paycheck replacement program uh, has benefited a lot of the um, businesses in the county that I've been made aware of. Um, I could not even tell you what kind of um, awards they've received. But I know that uh, there are several that have benefited from that. Um, so. Our endeavor is to go out and try to educate people on as much as possible, though I would say that y'all understand how overwhelming this is to people and the situations that they're in. And so um, we are going to do our best to get the word out on every program that's out there, but this is <coughs> initially um, focused on the smaller businesses. 
Next time we have on the agenda is fire and rescue update. Stacy Reeves, Chief of Fire and EMS. Good evening. Good evening. How are you? Before we get started, I'd like to introduce uh, Assistant Chief Jones. Uh, How you He's uh, been hired as a temporary employee to assist us with the transition, especially during this time of COVID, with so much documentation and um, research and kind of ordered supplies to keep our guys uh, steady. Uh, I'm going to allow Chief Jensen to introduce himself and give you a little bit of history about us. Um, yeah, I'm a career firefighter. As I said, I worked for the city of Richmond, uh, worked for Hanover County, uh, retired there recently, and uh, just excited to come on board. Uh, Chief Reeves is a, is a really good leader. The guys already expect it, you know, respecting and um, I just think uh, we can go a long way in a short period of time. Now, I thank y'all for the opportunity for having me. Thanks for coming on. Um, the first thing in the packet is the staffing. It continues to be challenging with full time vacancies and part time employees being unavailable during some breaks. Uh, one full time employee is still out on extended leave, currently interviewing for full time and part time fire EMT through medic and the fire captain position. We're winding down. Uh, the captain position has been closed. So we've, uh, I think we have two or three candidates left to interview. And then we'll be making a decision early next week, hopefully. Uh, currently, I see posted jobs on newly created professional Facebook page with great success and attracting attention. The page is and will continue to be managed and monitored by three upper administrative positions to ensure safety and positive promotion of the county and the fire department. Uh, the Facebook page really brought in a lot of applications that we were not getting in the past. So we, we look to improve that and also maybe put some public announcements out on that to improve uh, public awareness of things going on around the county and the state. Currently meeting with volunteer chiefs. We'll be working with county administrator and board, uh, I'm sorry, board members to produce an agenda for a work session to maximize productivity in that volunteer career uh, work session. Making plans to begin having chiefs meetings with all county chiefs and the Walkerton chief. I've already met with the county chiefs and I'll be meeting with the Walkerton chief very soon. Um, those meetings have gone very well and we're going to uh, plan to begin having chiefs of staff meetings, if you will, to bring all of us together to discuss plans, problems, solutions, and things like that. Go forward with a common goal. Continue to work on operational policies and to govern daily activity and improve quality of service and delivery. That speaks for itself. Do we have a date on when we're going to reschedule that work session yet? No, so. We were talking about the 7th of September, um, depending on the availability of volunteer chiefs and being able to talk to you guys to kind of get an agenda together. Um, what would the latest would have been? The very latest would be the regular meeting in September, but we're, our goal is the work session. Yeah, I think we probably prefer to do it in the work session. Yeah, yeah I'd like to get in the work session. Um, so I'll, I'll be pushing out and trying to get with you guys as soon as possible. Um, under apparatus, the new ambulances in service, the stretcher issue has been resolved under warranty. Engine one has been returned to service with all issues repaired. We'll be uh, working with the staff and vendors to create a contingency plan for maintenance and repairs, repairs in the future. We currently only have one engine, so that means if it needs a service or if it goes out of service for any reason, we do not have a fire engine in Central Garage or ALA to respond to call. So, it's something that we really need to address. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll be working together closely to try to figure that out. The leased engine was returned to AES one day after engine one was returned. AES did not pick the engine up until the following Monday. I just put that tad bit in there, but we didn't get charged for it. They just delayed the, the pickup because of their staffing. Station one uh, has broadband installed and is up and running at the station. Station one is still closed to the public due to the COVID. 19 pandemic. At this time, we have not reopened the hall for public rental. Um, 
kind of self-explanatory. Do you guys have any questions about that? Uh, equipment, uh, adequate levels of PPE are in supply for our responders. All personnel have been instructed that they must wear a mask in the public if they are in King William County uniform. Due to the impact of COVID-19 pandemic, many of the practices put in place during this time may become common practice to ensure safety of personnel and citizens. Uh, the fit testing has been completed with a couple of indiv individuals who are out for various reasons and will be tested ASAP on case by case when returning to work. We will be supplying structural firefighting gear, extractors, washers, and dryers to stations one, two, and three using the CARES fund, relief fund. Each fire department will own machines delivered to them, and each department will be solely responsible for any cost of operation and maintenance beyond the delivery. Basically, once they receive the washer and dryer, it's theirs, and if they have a problem, they have to take care of it with them. Um, in the noteworthy section, I'd like to uh, Thank you to the personnel that have been working extended shift hours to help overcome the schedule. We are very slim and a lot of our guys are working extra shifts to, to cover. It's, it's, it's been really tough and thank you to those guys that have been stepping up. And thanks to our county volunteer stations for helping cover calls during times of higher volume and critical calls. Mega Hick, West Point, and Walkerton, all three in the past month have stepped up to help us out. I really appreciate that. If you can couldn't make it without all the entities involved in this county. Have any of them had any major concerns or needs? As far as volunteers. the volunteers, yes. um, they haven't approached me with any. I, That's with, right. with my meeting with them, it was more of an introduction base. And I'm sure that when we meet as a group that there will be some more concerns brought up. At this point, they haven't delivered any serious concerns. Well, I'm looking forward to the discussion in September. Um, and uh, echoing what you said, thanks to everybody who's been stepping up. I just want to say, and, and I feel comfortable in speaking for the board that you know, with you guys being out there and on the front lines, you know, we want to make sure that you have what you need. So, if there's something that you need, um, you know, please voice it, and, and we want to make sure that you have it. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, there will be lots of concerns brought forth, I'm sure, once we start discussing things in a more formal fashion. So. Thank you. Thank you. Next item held the agenda is new business. 10A, motion to approve supporting the Economic Development Authority to enter into an agreement with All Points Partners, LLC. Mr. Ed Moore, District 5 Board Supervisor. Okay, can you hear me okay, Stephen? Yeah. Okay, um, this is a culmination of several months of work with the Quick Committee, the EDA, uh, Dr. White, Ms. Tassinari, and uh, this is the process. It's been reviewed by uh, the, the attorney, uh, Mr. McRoberts, and uh, I think we have a few more steps with Ms. Ms. Tassinari. If you would go through those final steps, I don't have that in front of me uh, that I can read from, just uh, the, the way that we're going to put this uh, together and issue a contract. Generally, what's going to happen is the, if the uh, board is agreeable and um, agrees to support this agreement um, between the EDA and the vendor, um, All Points Broadband Partners LLC, um, then we will move forward and submit the agreement to the company, have them sign, and then they will return it, and then the chair of the EDA will sign the document. And at that point, then we will enter into whatever kind of financial agreement um, has been addressed. I uh, think one of the things that uh, Mr. Moran wanted to make sure of is we may be able to utilize some of our CARES funding for this um, with the understanding that if there is some type of uh, issue um, later th uh, down the road, we do have between $275,000 that was set aside for broadband initiatives. Um, by the Board of Supervisors back about three to four years ago. And um, the EDA cannot extend those funds without Board of Supervisor approval. So, um, Ed, do you want to maybe either you or uh, one of the representatives from All Points talk about 
you know, just a, a couple of minute overview of what type of project we're even talking about, because it's, it's, in my mind, it's a pretty big deal. Uh, yeah. Sure, Mr. Uh, Jimmy Carr is on, actually online. Jimmy, do you have a, some words you can uh, talk about? Uh, yes, hi, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Um, well, I was just listening tonight. I wasn't planning to speak, but um, uh, thanks to Ed and everyone else who've been involved. Um, our plan is to work with the county as your uh, turnkey partner and single point of accountability to uh, develop and begin implementing a whole of county um, broadband access solution. Um, we plan to begin that process by working with um, Dominion Energy on the development of a regional fiber backbone. And then we're going to be working closely um, with other infrastructure providers and, and the county to um, uh, develop and implement a, a true long-term strategy to achieve universal coverage in King William. And that's a very important effort. It's not going to happen overnight, but um, we have an approach here that will get King William on a path to achieving that so that um, you know, no one in the county is unable to uh, get on the global internet. And for everyone on the board, this was a, a strategic plan, not a piecemeal plan that we had started to go down several, uh, about a year ago, I guess. We looked at utilizing some of the new broadband providers to extend out their network. And it only got us very little when you look at the big picture. Going this route with uh, all points, it allows us a more strategic uh, mid and long-term vision to get uh, as close as we can to universal coverage. We're really, really excited that we're going this route and uh, looking forward to working with all points and especially Jimmy Carr. And, and, and I think it's worth pointing out that this, uh, you know, all points is not. Any questions? The, what I was going to point out is all points is, is not just a design firm. They're not just here to draw a picture of internet and then say good luck and, and get your internet there. You know, they're going to be designing a network. They're going to be giving us the, the pathway to accessing state and federal funds. They're going to be working with us on those applications to access that funding. Uh, and then, you know, we'll, we'll actually be implementing. This is not something, uh, you know, that's, that's 30,000 feet or something that's a, a pipe dream. This is, this is setting in, in motion the wheels to get this done. After this is done, who will be operating? All points. Okay. I'm yes, we, we will not be that. owners of that. We're, yeah. we're, we'll be facilitating our own And the fiber you're talking about, I think you said Dominion Energy, does that exist now? This is the, this is the middle mile uh, upgrade. And uh, about a, what, a year ago, I think, the legislature opened up the opportunity for uh, enterprises such as Dominion to offer their middle mile fiber to ISPs, WISPs, and others to tap into and extend out. That's what All Points has done in the, uh, in the Northern Neck area, uh, four counties, uh, Westmoreland, uh, <laughs> I always forget the four counties, but their project is moving forward. We do the very same thing, very, a lot of uh, uh, analogies, uh, comparisons here in King William with uh, both Dominion, Rappahannock, and even perhaps one day Atlantic if they so desire. But uh, this, this really gets us into a, uh, a more of a, a universal coverage management plan and, and not, it's, it's going into this smartly and not piecemeal. And it sounds great. It, but again, my question is, does that fiber exist? No, so Dominion is going to be building out a fiber network okay, several that's all layers that's of their uh, essential infrastructure their sites. Um, and what the Virginia legislature basically enabled was... And a lot, a lot of where they bring their fiber will be based on where King William's needs are. Yeah. And so that's, yeah, that's what the legislation did, is it allows them to partner with someone like All Points to, instead of running it, as a pro flies to run it in areas that need uh, last month service. 
then all points can provision that last mile service to, uh, to the home. So, uh, and then understanding that a good portion of the county is covered by Rappahannock Electric Cooperative, that's already been addressed uh, in this as well, that we work directly with Rappahannock because Rappahannock is going to do that same type of build out as well. Um, so that, you know, there, there's going to be uh, no sudden turn. By the time this is done, you know, the, the idea here is that we've got pretty much near universal access to uh, broadband internet. I'd just like to point out again that if anybody didn't understand that this money was already out there, and we will probably be able to use some COVID money too. I just wanted to reiterate that. Yeah, that, that money's been laying out there for a good while. Yeah. Just for something like this. Exactly. It was the idea, I think, the rest of the was free. Exactly. We've been looking for a, a whole of county solution to use that type of funding on, and, uh, and that, that's what we have. And not turning it on. So, and this is, this is to, to, yeah, this is to get the ball rolling. Um, you know, there may be other investment down the line. This will cover uh, you know, getting, getting involved on so that we have a total picture of what we need, uh, what we have access to as far as federal and state funding, and uh, what other options are out there. Um, you know, in the meeting that we've had, we talked about opportunities with uh, federally recognized tribes. I mean, we've, we've talked about just about every opportunity to bring in outside funding that we can, and, and all points has had uh, some knowledge or, or, or experience with just about everything we brought up. So. Um, I think that uh, you know we left our meeting with them feeling really good about um, their experience, their know-how, and their ability to get this done. So with that, uh, I would go ahead and make a motion to approve supporting uh, the EDA entering into this agreement. Also, motion made properly seconded. Do I have any more discussion? Ms. Marks. Mr. Miskowski. Aye. Mr. Hodgins? Aye. Mr. Garber? Aye. Mr. Morin? Proudly say aye. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. <You're Richard>? <laughs> <laughs> aye. Okay. Thank you. Next item we have on the agenda 10B, Resolution 20 49, approving the creation of a finance board. <laughs> Gentlemen, what you have in front of you is Resolution 20-49, uh, and it's a request by the county administrator to establish a finance board. Uh, this is allowed in the Virginia Code, Section 58.1-3151, and it states that each locality may establish a county finance board. Uh, the board would consist of the chairman of the governing body, the treasurer of the county, and a, system, uh, a citizen of the county. And with this, um, I am attempting to lay some groundwork for the next elected treasurer. Um, our current treasurer will be retiring um, September 30th, and we will have an interim um, treasurer in place until the special election. Um, I think that we are all aware that um, the reports that probably should have been coming to the board um, over the last several years from some of our um, constitutional officers uh, have been remiss. And so by establishing this finance board, it will allow um, a monthly meeting with the treasurer to talk about the investments. The board has no authority over the treasurer or can dictate to the treasurer what investments to make and where, but it will be another step in transparency on the dollar amount, the investments, and the investment strategy of the treasurer. So I am requesting that the board consider approving resolution 2049, establishing the finance board and naming uh, Natasha Journalman, the director of finance as the citizen uh, to be appointed as a member of the finance board. Mr. Chair, I make a motion that we approve resolution 2049. Second. Motion made properly seconded to adopt resolution 20-49. Any more discussion? Seeing none, Ms. Lawrence. Mr. Miskowski? Aye. Mr. Hodges? Aye. Mr. Garber? Aye. Mr. Morin? Aye. Mr. Greenwood? Aye. Next to come up, resolution 20-50, instructing the Canyon County Treasurer's Office and collections of delinquent taxes. Next, 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 next. 
Gentlemen, again, what you have in front of you is a resolution uh, laying the groundwork for the next elected treasurer uh, to understand the expectations of the Board of Supervisors when it comes to collecting delinquent <coughs> property taxes. Um, by code, there are um, several ways that a treasurer can go and collect um, delinquent taxes. Um, that is an assignment to an attorney for collections, a bank account lien, division of motor vehicle DMV registration withholding, employment liens, wage liens, seizure and sale of property, tax sale at public auction, third party liens, and or withholding of state tax refunds or debt set off. And even though this resolution has no teeth, it is instructing the next newly elected treasurer of the board's wish that delinquent taxes be addressed in a timely manner is the as the responsibility of the treasurer is stated in code and in their guidance. Just answer my only question. Well, my question would be, I know we don't necessarily have the legal authority to enforce the date upon the treasurer, but could we put a date in this resolution that says this is when the board would like to have this result within three years, five years? Absolutely. Whatever date that you might want, we can have a revision to it. I mean, I'm, just, I'm just wondering, you know, it, because if we're just trying to lay the groundwork for what our expectation is, then I don't see any harm in having something like that in there. My question would be, what's an appropriate date? Um, well, what, but uh, for these matters to be resolved, you know, we obviously we've got some that are going on decades, and that's not acceptable. But, you know, yeah, that's see, that's what I was going to ask. You know, okay, you're going to have new ones come along too. So, are you are you dating that? Well, obviously, we want the ones that are currently delinquent to be resolved. They need to be resolved now. They don't need to be resolved in three years, five years, ten years. They need to be resolved now. Old is what seven years. That's yes. and that's too much. I mean, I, 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 I'd be in favor of three years. And that, that's my understanding is that most of these things are are sent to that type of, of you know service where these things are either threatened auction or auction in three years, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So why don't we say where do we need to put that? Um, and <laughs> well, I'm just trying to read the resolution. Uh, it would be under the now, therefore, be it resolved um, for the third line the treasurer's instructed yeah. to begin uh, collecting line 32, the taxes, and, uh, and have it utilizing the methods outlined outline here and uh, within three years. Three years years from the date of this uh, resolution or you know three years from the the, the date yeah, of the day when the same thing is what we want i mean again the rest of the properties that are out there that are 20 years in length but right. I, I want those resolved now <laughs> so three so, years from the uh, date of delinquency yeah okay we will amend that and so i'll then move approval of resolution 20-50 r so could i ask a question before we uh, get there sure well, um, it also states in here treasurer or assignment of attorney. Is that the treasurer's discretion? Any attorney? Yes, but I do believe, and Mr. McDonald's, correct me if I'm wrong, that we can um, utilize the county attorney or the county attorney's plan. Yeah, absolutely. Well, well I mean, generally, the treasurer has to come say, comes down to, to a certain degree with these and very Well, that we've discussed before, there's firms that specialize in this. Exactly. I'm saying Manson has an arm that does specialize in this. We do. Uh, but uh, that, you know, generally speaking, if a house or a property is, is placed into the tax distress option, that the attorneys derive their fees from proceeds uh, that, that come from that sale. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the county will will get its what is owed in taxes, the attorney will take his fees from yeah, the sale. The fees, the fees from the attorney, to, attorney to attorney very great. Well, sure, but I guess my point is that we, we, it, it's pretty well established in this line of work that they derive their fees from the sale and not from the, the county. Yeah, but if you had one attorney that called you, say, $2,500, and that's what I was going to get that, maybe $2,500 for the cost. And then you have another attorney that may find a way to spend more, more time than $5,000 for the cost. So that would come out of, if, if the property doesn't meet, the amount of taxes owed, and there's some of them out there because they are land. That's just the only reason I asked that question. Mr. Garber, I, I can address that 
the fees are set by statute and they're fairly uh, you know, consistent among firms that handle it. Uh, of course, all the fees in the end upon sale do go to the judge for approval as to reasonableness, uh, but uh, it's, it's very standard. It's 20% uh, uh, before a lawsuit is filed, 25% after is what's in the statute. And in some cases, some of these properties do not sell their public auction because they are landlocked. Mm -hmm. And in the joint, so what happens then? Well, in those cases, uh, nobody comes forward to purchase them, or it's just simply not the kind of property that's appropriate for that process, in which case uh, it, it's simply not going to be able to be sold. Right. But we, get, we generate a bill automatically for that parcel that's not sold, correct? Well, certainly every property is taxed. Well, he's talking about. No, no, I'm talking about, about the but well, attorney that's in town. I, I can't speak how the firms do it, but mm -hmm. what we do at Sands Anderson is we try to lump properties that aren't worth very much together with properties that are. Mm -hmm. So we can do one advertisement. Yeah, we can go to court all at one time. Mm -hmm. And so the properties right. that do pay help pay for the ones that don't. Mm -hmm. And the idea they all get sold. Uh, other firms have different practices, but that's our practice. We have a motion they can probably take. Is there any more discussion? Ms. Lawrence? Mr. Hodges? Aye. Mr. Garber? Aye. Mr. Morin? Aye. Mr. Biscoffy? Aye. Mr. Greenwood? Aye. <laughs> Uh, Sam D, preliminary update on Treasurer's Office performance audit. Thanks, Bobby. That's Eric. Gentlemen, this is just an update. It is not the final um, audit that was requested. As you're aware, I had um, notified the board that I felt that it was time that we did a performance audit of both the Treasurer's Office and the Commissioner of Revenue's Office, uh, just to ensure that procedures were being followed and uh, also to assess the level of knowledge of the staff. Um, we contracted with Robinson Farmer Cox Associates, which is our auditing firm that will be handling the capper for the firm. Uh, they came out August 14th and 13th and 14th and did a two day um, analysis. Um, one of their attorneys, I mean, sorry, one of their auditors came back today, will be back on Wednesday and is doing a, a cash reimbursement audit as well. And then they will also be out again September 28th, 29th, and 30th to do the turnover audit um, when Mr. Whip retires and then the interim uh, treasurer takes office. But I wanted to go ahead and put this in front of you. There will be a formal document that will be created, um, probably brought to the board sometime in September once we receive it um, from the auditing firm. And then the one that's going to be completed on the Commissioner of Revenue's office is scheduled for uh, September 2nd and 3rd. And that will probably be brought to the board uh, in October when that is finally finished. Um, but what you will note in the preliminary um, notes is that uh, a lot of it is procedural issues. Um, that can be addressed. Uh, there are a few things that um, definitely concern me, definitely concern the auditors. Um, one of them is the wire transfers. Um, they noted that wire transfers can be initiated, approved, and posted by one person. Uh, this definitely needs to have a dual uh, process put in place, checks and balance. Um, lack of adequate documentation on the wire transfers. Uh, anything when it comes to bonds and wire transfers. The finance department has extensive documentation um, on it and um, kind of surprised that the treasurer's office um, doesn't follow suit as well because we, they have access to the SNAP system as well. Uh, you know, a lot of it, like I said, is procedural issues, um, just kind of some bad habits that need to be uh, readdressed. Uh, one of them is um, contracting County banking business on personal cell phones, uh, not maintaining a log of the mail that comes into the treasurer's office. Um, that is something that they do for the lockbox outside, but not for the mail that comes in. 
Uh, also the fact that um, all treasurer's personnel can void transactions in the accounting system. That is um, not a good process. Uh, an example was given of uh, during tax time, they may have um, say $50,000 in checks and then say umpteen thousands of dollars in cash. Well, we bank at CNF down in West Point and they will hold it until they have enough to take down there. So that $50,000 in checks is not earning us any interest. Uh, they recommended that we uh, procure one of those small devices that you can just run the checks through and it automatically hits the bank. And then they can take the time to get down and take the cash when you know, they feel like they have enough of them to deposit. Um, basically, they found that all treasurer's office personnel can remove penalties and interest from tax accounts. Um, they also found some issues um, with the business license when it came to the Commissioner of Revenue's office and the fact that um, you can be paying for a business license, which is due March 1st. Uh, if you put your application in and pay in, um, say, August, it does not backdate it, so there's no penalties and interest that they were capturing. Um, also, in the way that the information is sent over to the treasurer's office on business license, um, it doesn't break out any penalties and interest that are uh, charged when they are charged. So therefore, we are overstating our business license revenues. Um, definitely some um, issues with some loss of revenue. Our, our meals tax, that is a trust tax. Um, Restaurants are supposed to submit that by the 20th of each month. Uh, in many cases, there were not any kind of penalties or interest collected on that. And there was something in here about the general ledger, the way that um, prior uh, fiscal year taxes, delinquent taxes were being collected. That's something that's a general ledger issue and the finance department is already working on that. Uh, something that did concern me was number 15. Uh, when they reviewed the Fund 999, which is a clearing account, um, it showed uncollected meals tax and business license tax balances. And there should not be any at all. Uh, they could not find any land sales for delinquent taxes since 2012. And also you know, the simple fact that the combination to the safe is known by all of the employees. And the treasurer also has um, treasurer's checks that he writes. Um, refunds out of and three of the four employees in the office um, have the ability to write on write those checks themselves and four actually have um, signature at the bank. And I bring this forward because I'm still grappling with the fact that we have multiple banks. We have four banks that we utilize that as I found out through this um, audit. Uh, multiple accounts, and the only group of people that have access or eyes on is the treasurer's office. Um, I have asked the treasurer, um, the director of finance has asked the treasurer to have a view only access to the bank accounts. It's county money, it's paid by the tax assessors, I mean by the taxes, by the citizens. Um, the finance department, county administrator, and other departments are um, responsible for preparing budgets that we bring to the board that you approve each year. And yet we have no access to you, our accounts. And I find that absolutely unacceptable. And yet I find we have no authority to be given that access. So auditors can stand there and tell you all day long that we should have eyes on, that there should be a separate um, group of people looking at the information, but per statute, we don't have the authority to demand it. So hopefully the interim treasurer will be more cooperative mm -hmm. and willing to share information that they are reconciling. I mean, we just need to know, you know what accounts we have, what they are, how the funds hit them, and you know, we can reconcile on our end as a checks and balance if that's so, um, the direction that the auditors recommend. But that was me standing on my my perch preaching about that. That's just a sore spot for me.
With the numbers on here in order of priority, or is this just random numbers? Just random. What, what is the conflict with uh, consideration should be given to uh, remote bank deposits? Physically, the bank is physically located in the town of West Penn. Is that some form of a conflict? Well, I think what they were talking about is that, you know, staff has to run the checks and the cash down to uh, the bank in West Point. Mm -hmm. And um, there are devices that we can utilize now that will at least get the check information to the bank you know, immediately. Uh, cash you know, will always be different, but um, as we found out, we have a um, bank account with Sona Bank, Bank of Essex, Union Bank, yeah. CNF, and then we might actually do one more, but I don't think that it's still up. That's a factor. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, so, just like we don't have statutory authority to ask them what they they need to do the tax sales by, um, is there any harm in just passing a motion right now that the Board of Supervisors collecting respect, respectfully requests that you be given your requested access? Well, I think you're talking to a constitutional officer who's an elected official. I think there's nobody better to talk to them than elected officials. Okay. Then I make a motion that the board authorize the statement for requesting politically. That Ms. Tassinari be given a request of action. All right. I agree to second in there before you finish. He's already done trying the email route and it doesn't seem to work. The okay. prepare a statement for the chairman's signature. Thanks very yeah. much. Do we need to do that or just? Yes. Okay. There's, uh, a, there's a motion in the second. Motion in the second. May I have a discussion? Uh, yes. Ms. Lawrence. Mr. Barber. Aye. Mr. Morin. Aye. Mr. Muskowski. Aye. Mr. Hodgins. Aye. Mr. Greenwood. Uh, we are in E with the resolution 2051. Resolution 20 51. Unappropriating funding for the Commission of Revenue Positions against Bobby Tess and Mary County Minister. Gentlemen, the memo that you have in front of you um, basically details what the Commission of Revenue Office responsibilities are for the website and many other COR websites. Um, it also provided you information about the 2021 reassessment and included um, an email uh, in there from the commissioner to Steve Chastain of Bright Minds. Um, Bright Minds contracted with us to um, handle the reassessment for about $156,000. Um, the county administrator was listed as the primary on the RFP, but it was definitely stated that the commissioner of revenue uh, and the director of finance would be kept in the loop on all information, which they have been. Uh, throughout this reassessment, uh, staff in my department and in the finance department have done the majority of work in assisting uh, with the cleanup. And so where we stand on this is that um, the Commissioner of Revenue is refusing to accept the reassessment document until the Board of Equalization has um, finished with it. And then that ties into our vision software. Um, as you're aware, the Board approved us moving to a new financial system, Edmonds. We need to get away from the BAI municipal software. It was a DOS system, it was antiquated, the support was dismal, and Edmonds is, well, it's a 21st century software which will make all of our lives much, much easier. Uh, and it comes with excellent canned reports, um, kind of a point and click on those. Um, Vision is an appraisal software. We spoke with the Commissioner of Revenue and her staff about this, that we are going to need to move away from BAI or Bright uh, with the implementation of Edmonds because Vision communicates very well with Edmonds. 
Uh, so we went through the RFP process. Um, there was a member of the Commissioner of Revenue's Department on the uh, award um, committee. And again, my staff and the director, I mean, the finance staff as well, um, have done a great deal of the legwork, cleaning up information, uh, transitioning it. Uh, we were to implement the system, or we are going to implement the system, the beginning of October. And when Travis Wolf um, reached out to the Commissioner of Revenue about this, she basically said that she just did not fully support it. She wasn't going to work with us on it. Um, and that we would maybe wait until one of the individuals working in finance now, MAT, Tegel, um, gets back to maternity leave. Well, this is their system. This vision is for the COR's department. It's about appraisal. So the only ones that are going to be using the software. So if we were to push it back, every two weeks it would cost us $11,000. That's not, that's not going to happen. We are going to implement this software. And we're going to implement it and make sure that the information that Bright Minds has worked so diligently on over the last 18 months, which is correct, and has been vetted by more than just Bright Minds, when it is entered into visions, then that will be our appraisal system of record. And that's why also in this um, memo, I am requesting that um, one, the board consider allowing me to contract a full-time tax assessor so that we can set up a tax assessor's office. That way vision would be managed by the tax assessor's office. The commissioner of revenue would still be able to handle their job or duties, um, parcel splits, these things. But the problem is, is that instead of allowing them access to the software, they would need to create a form to part of the backup documentation and submit it to the tax assessor's office. And then that information would be entered and then they would be notified after the fact. After looking at what was not done correctly over the last few years, and you cannot hang this on the last assessors. Yes, they did miss things, but there has been a lot missed by the Commissioner of Revenue's office. The town of West Point had multiple properties that should have been on the books. And it got very embarrassing when I was on number nine, having to call Mr. Edwards and go, John, just want you to know, this property has been built, it's been lived in for the last three years, but it's never been put on the rolls. And yet they can go back and find the documentation where they think it's up here. So that's kind of where we're at. If I felt more confidence in the Commissioner of Revenue's office on entering data and then checking behind by another individual or um, following up, it would be different, but I don't. Um, and I know that Bright Minds and you know, Emily Teagle and the finance staff have put a great deal of effort into getting it a clean appraisal. And the only way that I can truly keep the Commissioner of Revenue staff out of vision is to have a tax assessor's office and pull those responsibilities out of their office. At the same time, that requires money. And so I am asking the board to unappropriate one position in the Commissioner of Revenue's office. Um, the Commissioner of Revenue's office receives supplemental funding from the um, state comp board. Uh, we received money for Sally Pearson. We received about 23,000 for the chief deputy commissioner. And for the other two deputy positions, we received $5,487 each. So what I am requesting is that the board unappropriate the county supplemental funding for one of the positions to be redirected either towards IT support or the assessor's office. To help offset that cost. Do you have any idea what uh, the pay scale will be for an assessor? Well, when we were doing interviews, we were looking at probably between eight seventy-five and ninety thousand 
annually. And the first thing out of their mouth was, we will need an assistant and probably a, another full-time position. Um, the avenue that I'm going to bring to you um, next is basically contracting that. I think one of the things that y'all are very aware of, and Gloucester has found this out as well, is that when a county hires a tax assessor, they come in, you know, they have to maintain their licenses and certifications. Um, they set up the um, department, and then if they're good, within two years they're gone, and then we're back in the same boat again. Um, so looking at a contracted full time, where we don't have to pay VRS, we don't have to pay um, all of that, and they come along with a uh, assistant as well, um, is an avenue that y'all may want to consider. So the contract would be, we would just be paying a contract and no doubt, no correct? But um, <clears throat> what I have uh, provided to you is resolution 20-51R. And um, I had initially requested um, unappropriating two positions, um, but I believe that the board requested that I um, change it to one position. So you will note on the uh, revised resolution that SD funds only one, um, unappropriates only one um, position. It does not touch um, anything that the state comp board provides. The, the assessor, we, we wouldn't have to do the four year or six year reassessment if we, if we had a physical uh, contract with an assessor. We would, we would have to, we would by statute, yes. Can, can you, or Mr. Chastain, explain to me the email contained in the memo in which they discuss the values that are in this vision beta and what try to shed some light on that because I'm not understanding the response from Mr. Chastain about whether or not he can uh, certify the values or whatever is meant by that. Um, Stephen, do you need me to read what you had in your email? Uh, no, I, I remember, I remember the email. Um, yeah, good evening once again. Uh, basically saying that once the data conversion commences, so actually let me back up. So we finished all of our work in uh, really early August and last week of July. And we did all that work, the entire reassessment, the 18 months uh, that Ms. Tassinari mentioned was all conducted in <clears throat> one database. So that was the, the BAI Bright software. Um, and it, in order to convert all that over and for it to match, um, you know, a 100% match, I think that actually takes a little more time and effort on, on Vision's part. So what I would have to do, what, what our company would have to do is go back through each record and verify that that information uh, converted accurately. And in my experience, I found that it really doesn't happen that smoothly, and especially not on a uh, you know really tight timeline like that. So does that does that help to answer your question? I'm not entirely sure. It may answer the question, but it may raise more questions. Um, okay. So, are, are, is that meant to question whether or not it's a reasonable timeline for us to try to march forward with this conversion? The values would have to match. I mean, is it possible? Yeah, I think it's. I think it's possible, but you know, realistically. I don't think the transfer of data would, would be the same um, in, in, you know, in that, in that time frame. So basically we had to, we looked at all the values and ran our final analysis somewhere between, you know, 50 and 75 separate reports on all the data in the BAI software database. Um, 
with the conversion to actually do it right. And I mean, they, I'm sure they could freeze the values and make them match, but it won't be a full implementation of that software. Stephen, can I ask, um, now, when you did the reassessment, you entered all of the information into Bright, correct? That's right. Okay, and so the transferring of the information into Edmonds, that is why we were doing the beta test. So that basically the commissioner's office could look at what was in Bright, which they're used to seeing. It just mm -hmm. happened to be the new corrected numbers and then what had been transitioned to vision. So it shouldn't have been apples and oranges. I mean, there might have been some discrepancies or some anomalies on the transition, but mm -hmm. the reality is, is I mean, if you're looking at, you know, residence 103 and the information in Bright from your reassessment, and then you're looking at residence 103 in vision, that's basically what we were asking. For the beta, correct? Yeah, that's that's what I understand. Um, that's that's correct. Yes. Right. So, and the thing is, is that the books are going to be run out of bright this year, correct? Even though we're going to do a transition to vision. That's that's right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So basically, vision is just going to be the new receptacle. But once the books are closed and the reassessment is. Um, uploaded and everything, then at that point we will cut off bright and we will only have vision. Yeah, that's right. Yep. So what is the problem with the certification? With the problem with certification certifying, is it the two different systems that we're using or they just the numbers don't match? Well it's what it is is that vision is a new, you know, the right. new software, and so whenever you transition data from one to another, there's going to be some crosswalks that don't, you know, that either break or there's an issue. But that's why you do the beta test, and that's what we've been requesting of the Commissioner of Revenue's office, because what they have in Bright is the assessed values for what they should be have been looking at for years, and then what's been transitioned into vision may look a little bit different, but primarily the information should be the same. But it is a completely different looking animal mm -hmm. than Bright. And so, you know, the, the problem that I had is it's be like me saying, you know, you know, I can't validate what's in the general ledger. Well, I know what's in the general ledger. I know how it's broken out. I know how it's set up. That's standard, okay? So the same thing when it comes to Bright, you know, what was transitioned over to Vision is the same information through the reassessment. It's just that it may look different, or if there's an error, then that's what the beta test is. Basically, she asked Steve a question that she should have asked Vision, and Steve saying you need to ask Vision. Mm -hmm. um, so. This is this is quite a bit to, to try to think about. I think quite honestly, um, I'm certainly not going to sit here and say this is the first time I've heard we've had issues in the commissioner's office. Okay, that would not be true. Um, but I also think that I, I would probably like some more time to discuss this assessor's office and what our options are there, what this would look like, what, what exactly they'd be offering, and uh, really understand that better before we make that type of decision. And I'm also sensitive to the fact that there, there is a lot going on right now in, you know, in all of the offices, including the commissioner's office, um, with reassessments going on and with system transitions and all of those things. And that's stressful for everyone, and I'm willing to be somewhat sensitive to that. I personally, and I'll just flip the idea right now, would like to probably table this, discuss it more in depth at the work session. Table the assessor or the resolution? Both. Okay. Um, 
I don't want to that. That was that was my thought initially to begin with. That there's so much more that we have to look at. You know, we we didn't really go in depth you know, initially speaking about this. The reason we went into closed session last time was to discuss this. We can't say what we're going to discuss. But that was the reason we're getting ready. Yeah, well, that's why I talked all y'all today and decided that we could take it from two back to one if you would keep it going. Now it's all messed up. So I'm not going to say what it is. I mean, you know, it's a majority of votes. So did you make a motion? No, I did not make a motion. I'm just, I'm just. I think we should get rid of one of the positions, like you said, because for the reasons why we had to do it at the closed session, because we can't say these other things, maybe we need to look at about the assessor's office and maybe another position or whatever. But that's just my two cents. Bill and Ed. Yeah, <laughs> there's, there's a lot of questions, so I would, I would admit, but. Um, Uh, I would like to, I would like to table it to the work session. What what does this do to the software change? That's a fair question. Well, I guess I will have to find out if there's a way to not provide the Commissioner of Revenue's office revision software and just let them have you only and then another department handle all your data entry to ensure that's done correctly. No, I mean, we're both, what I'm getting is your transition is going forward. Yes, of course, it definitely yeah, is. Well, I'm, going out of bed. I'm not going to spend another $33,000 waiting on them to come back because the Commissioner Revenue's office doesn't want to deal with it. I think probably Bobby, the, the hang up is when we see the figure on the tax assessor. I get it's at least I think it's what some folks were looking at. Uh, I mean, I don't have a problem with you funding one position, but uh, well, I, I would like to know a little bit more on the tax assessor. That's fine, but remember two years ago when we were going to hire an in-house, we had a budget of $164,000 for a tax assessor's office. So this is less. This way we'll have all the records in-house. We don't have to worry about getting somebody to come in. We'll have all the records in-house. Everything will be easy. We can do it every three years. It's easy to update. You can update it every day, every week. We make changes. We don't have to go back to the assessor. And find all these errors that we just found up in the last one. We told at the beginning of the meeting all these 261 parcels have been missed. I don't, I don't think Travis is saying that, that he disagrees. No, 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 I think he's just saying that. Right, we should wait and maybe the assessor for it. I'll start it then. Nobody wants to say it. I'll make a motion that we pass resolution 20 S 51 R. But then the next thing we have to do is talk about the assessor and do that separately. But I'll make the first motion. All right, we gotta get it going, and if we don't, we'll do something else. All right, you just the motions for R. R. Just, add, just for add, the position, add, not third grade. Not third. I'll, I'll second. We have any more discussion? Now, uh, so if we if we did fund the one position, and we don't generate the the assessor and the assistant that's and then, then, then we've got okay right. we didn't talk about it, it. it should be all the issue right this is just about the funding one position cover some of the costs any other discussion Olivia? mr morin can, I'm, I'm sorry, it was difficult to follow along. I'm, I'm very sorry. Can someone encapsulate? Stephen has moved approval of resolution 20-51R, which is pro unappropriating funding for the Commissioner of Revenue position, a single position. Aye. Mr. Muskowski? Aye. Mr. Hodges? Aye. Mr. Garber? Aye. Mr. Greenwood? Aye. That motion carries. Now, Ms. Sassan, we can move on to the 
Well, my um, request was that the board consider us contracting with a full-time um, individual to be our tax assessor. Uh, this would allow us to remove that from the Commissioner of Revenue's um, office, but I will provide more detailed information at the work session, if that's what you would like, on uh, the cost and additional information. Um, as part of this, though, I was also going to bring up the Board of Equalization. Uh, you have a handout from me up there, and it is that time with the reassessment coming to an end. Uh, Board of Equalization would be part of a tax assessor's um, office responsibility, um, even though the Board of Supervisors approves all of their resolutions. So um, what I would like you to do, we are going to be publicizing the positions, five positions, one from each district, two alternates because of the size of the um, commission. Uh, we'll be publicizing it twice in um, probably this week. I already published it tonight. Okay. Published it tonight and then again in September. Uh, we'll be accepting applications through September 30th. Um, each of you will be responsible for making your recommendation. We will sit on the um, Board of Equalization from the district. And then um, I would assume as a board, y'all will decide who the two alternates will be. Um, so that's just kind of a heads up on that. But what exactly would you like me to bring back to you in September's work session on? Well, here, yeah. here's the thing. You, you, you make a, a, a very fair point that this is the direction that we wanted to go for some time. And then we pretty much know what that is. It's just a different way to get, uh, you know, get there. So, um, you know, now that we've taken the action that we've taken, I, I'm fine to go ahead and move forward with that. Yeah, I am too. We probably should have been all together, but we did all. We did what we did, and now, now we have to uh, make the commissioner too much of a burden for the commission of revenue as well. Hey, Bobby, mm -hmm. dealing with the tax assessor, are there companies out there that contract with this? I mean, I don't know. Uh, I would say maybe, um, since we already know Stephen Chastain and his partner, um, we know their work. That was one of the reasons I just reached out to him, um, since he'll be finishing up this reassessment and then working up with us through the Board of Equalization process. Um, I just figured we could just duct tape and uh, keep him on. Um, what I was thinking is that um, we could do a contracted tax assessor for a couple of years and evaluate it and um, make sure that this is actually working for us well um, and either continue the contracting or look to seek someone in house and bring on an accounting employee. But I think that we probably need at least two years of um, time to evaluate the process. That's what I thought the whole process was. This was just an interim from going from a company that was handling the assessment to a guy that was well, but it's his company, but then turning him into part time and then it has all the knowledge, has all the information in house. Like I said, if it works really well, then we can create that department. We were talking about assessing the department for the county and hire full time people with benefits. But right now, I guess what Bobby was saying, this is just a temporary consulting job with the company that is doing it that already has knowledge of the information. And then they would be able to continue on a sort of an interim basis. And then move forward. But I did have another question about the assessment. Did it come out? I mean, we've heard rumors that it was going to be 20, but since COVID came, is the, do you have any idea? Is the assessment, was the assessment 20% higher than what it was? I mean, we haven't recorded it. Well, um, Stephen, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm believing that residential is right around 21%. Oh, wow. And vacant land was right around, what, 1.64%. Commercial, though, I wasn't really sure. Yeah, that's that's fairly fairly accurate. Um, it was the overall increase. That was the question, correct? The overall increase was twenty seven percent overall. Um, the market the market adjustment was twenty two percent. So we had some, as we talked about tonight, some data corrections that took it up a little bit higher than uh, the market adjustment for for the county. 
So. But also keep in mind that um, this budget that we were looking in, um, we reduced the portion of the taxes um, for the balance of the year. Um, we're at 86 cents for the first six months, and then uh, we dropped it to like a flipping 1% like y'all had requested. So um, it is scary when people hear 21%, 26%, but um, the calendar year tax rate will be adjusted by the board in the, the budget process. I guess like Travis and I, they'll know what the assessed for the rent mode. Board of Equalization, we have to reduce the actual rate to make it so that people don't pay by more than 1%. And like the Bobby's budget that she had previously done before COVID, we were maybe thinking about doing increases. But like she said, now we're just going to keep it at the 1%, not raise it. So you have to bring it. No increase to the citizens of the county. The reassessment will. Balance everything out except for the allocated allowed one percent, so it's going to be slightly up, but nothing like everybody thinks. You know, the twenty percent, twenty-seven percent more and taxes are going to go up, not really. But it was one percent more than a couple dollars. Motion on it, just permission to provide more information. No, 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 I thought we were. Oh, right, you did. Why you changed it? That's right. Well, I'm all over the place. Okay. I think it's a discussion. I'm going to always accuse them of coming in here with a mindset. I'll make this motion that we approve resolution 2061. Was it all? Well, I don't think we need that. We've done that. Yeah. So now we need a motion to. Uh, direct the county administrator to move forward with the creation of a tax. Okay. So, so far. Yeah, I don't think we have a resolution. Okay, so there's no resolution. Far from it. Consensus? No, it's a formal measure. We need to do Okay, I'll second. Okay. Okay. Motion made by the second to allow Ms. Casimir to create the reassessment position. Well, probably second is the tax assessor. Okay, tax assessor, right. And any more discussion? This is Lawrence. Mr. Muskowski? Aye. Mr. Hodges? Aye. Mr. Garber? Aye. Mr. Warren? Aye. Mr. Greenwood? Aye. Next item we have on the agenda is 11, and that's administrative matters from our county administrator. And board information. This is short and sweet. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to make you aware that Dennis Gaston with a Virginia Department of Forestry brought us a check for $16,451. Um, they had done a timber harvest at Sandy Point State Forest, and since they don't pay um, taxes, uh, in lieu of that, they pay the localities 25% of the uh, funds they receive. So we were very grateful to him for a check for $16,451. I'm sorry. Any comments from board supervisors from you? Uh, no, it's kind of difficult. I had a lot of bandwidth issues this evening, a lot of a lot of fading out, but um, I understand there's quite a few out in the audience. I hope I'm glad we were able to get the all points contract uh, closer to being executed. And I very much hope to see everyone on September work session. Thank you. Mr. Goff, I'd like to thank everybody for coming tonight. This is every day, it's a little bit larger crowd. Uh, it's a tough decision you know, what we did tonight uh, and it's something that you know, we had to do you know, you're not going to always make everybody happy you, know, you have to weigh all the, the body of evidence and you know, to me that's all we could thank everybody that's 
Um, echoing somewhat Stuart's comments there, I, I, I take no joy in the action um, you know, that, that we took in that office tonight because ultimately, um, I, you know, you're talking about somebody's job. Mm -hmm. And in my mind, the axe falls on an innocent head one way or another. Uh, but we clearly have insufficiencies that need to be cleared up. And I think we've gotten to the point where the only way that we can get a grasp on that is to try to get some control of the situation. Um, but I'm not happy with that. Hopefully we can move forward in a positive direction. And I do thank Ms. Massoneri and her staff for the work that they've done in, in bringing this to resolution. Um, I would like to take a, a, a moment to speak uh, on behalf of, of two um, your people that we've lost in the last couple of days. One is uh, Lowell Kravis, a near neighbor down the street to this complex. Um, the, the Kravis family uh, has, has deep roots here, and uh, Lola and her husband Lenny and her daughter Jenny uh, have been dear friends of mine for a long time. And so I did want to mention her loss uh, and, and please keep that family in your prayers. And then uh, Brian Brett, who was uh, a good personal friend of mine, um, many uh, from the West Point area will, will know and remember Brian since his days. Uh, won in racing championships as a as a uh, crew chief over in Saluda, but he was also uh, worked across the street from me. I worked for him for uh, for a few years when I was younger, and uh, but he's always been uh, close by and uh, and knew each other pretty well. And Brian passed rather unexpectedly um, this weekend, so uh, keep the Brett family in your prayers as well. Um, the news with all points tonight, uh, I think, without COVID, would receive. Quite a great fanfare. Um, you know, this this announcement, um, you know, should should rival that that the King and Queen recently made because we're we're marching in that same direction using the same process, um, different vendor, but the same process of, of getting universal access to broadband internet in this county. And we've we've taken a huge step in that. That's been uh, you know years in the making, um, and. Uh, the quick committee, and, and Ed certainly deserve a lot of credit for that. Uh, but but also uh, every member of the board that set aside the money that we used tonight to make that happen as well deserve credit for being, uh, you know, forward thinking in, in how we we're going to approach this problem, this problem and get it solved. So I'm looking forward to uh, the next uh, 12 months or so to then see what our what our plan is and how we execute it. And uh, I think in, in a few years we're going to have a a lot of people with the problem solved. Obviously, we wish we could get that problem solved in weeks to, uh, to, to conquer the COVID problem. That's that's probably not going to happen. But I do know that one thing that all points will be doing is working on ways that they can implement any type of uh, service at all as quickly as possible. But then there's also the, the, the longer term plan and how they get there. So, uh, thanks again for coming and uh, hope to see you all again. Help me stay in the future. Didn't leave anything. Four lines. Travis said, about Greg, he was only 49 years old. Uh, and to the family, uh, they have fairly deep roots and I guess a close proximity to King Mary County and New County. They're real good things. Anyway, uh, yeah, we don't take any pleasure in a lot of the things we end up having to do uh, as best that there are changes that need to be made. And uh, we will see what the future holds. Uh, I know when we put that money going to the uh, quick committee and all that, when we put that money aside, everybody thought for sure that we won't spend it. And it's been laying there for three, three or four years. Uh, $200. $25,000 and we didn't touch it. Now we've got a project that I'm hoping will be worthwhile to be spent on. And that's a, to be honest, that's why I was asking about the infrastructure. $225,000 in that market is not a whole lot of money. Uh, and we're trying to explain it. Anyway, thank you for coming out and uh, see you at the work session. All right, ready? Okay. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, of course. Oh, <laughs> 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 I think so. 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 I think
can maybe we can find something else for them here. I don't know. That there are always options. Maybe it's not quite a termination, but can we you know, transfer or something like that? Looking at all those kind of things, hopefully that would be a better option instead of something like that. And like I said, that's why we're elected to make these unfortunate decisions. Like I said, it's not not that uh, there's that that's why we are here. So unfortunately. And uh, thanks everybody for coming in now, Travis. <laughs> oh no, thanks everybody for here. Uh, unfortunate death seems to be climbing. The infection rate seems to be climbing. I just hope they can get a grasp on it or find the antivirus soon. Mr. Chairman, in yeah. accordance with Section 2.2-37-1181 of the Code of Virginia, I move that the Board of Supervisors convene and close meeting to consider a personnel matter involving the appointment of individuals to board and commissions. Second. Mr. Mayden, probably second. Uh, Mrs. Lawrence. Mr. Muskowski. Aye. Mr. Hodges. Aye. Mr. Barber. Aye. Mr. Warren. Aye. Mr. Greenwood. Aye. We're in the closed session. That's shortage.